Hello, and welcome to Labyrinth of the Bazaar, a podcast where we discuss, review, and analyze speculative fiction such as horror, apocalyptic, dark fantasy, and other subgenres. I'm Andrea. And my name is Elia. And in today's episode, we're discussing the theme of capitalism in the Jurassic Park franchise. But before we get to our main discussion for today, I will be doing a quick follow-up listener mail segment. A listener and friend of mine, Sama, brought to our attention additional racism in the movie and the people involved in Wonder Woman 1984. I will be paraphrasing and directly quoting what she said in our YouTube comment section for this episode. I also want to preface this by saying that Sama is Egyptian, so there is credibility in what they're saying about their culture and politics. And Sama looked over my notes and okayed everything I'm going to say. Regarding the Egyptian oil empire plotline, Sama said, quote, The concept is purely American, since it is illegal for oil wells to be privatized in most Arab countries. The ones in Egypt are government-owned. The Egyptian who owned an oil empire in the movie, Amir, was wearing what Bedouins usually wear, or what we call Sinai Arabs, since they're usually Arabs that come from Libya, Palestine, and Iraq, and usually live in Sinai or Suez, not in large cities like Giza, where the pyramids are. Therefore, the pyramids being close to the city and the Benduin attire Amir was wearing do not match up. There's a stereotype that Benduins are violent weapons dealers, which I'm guessing is what inspired them to write this in the script. Also, something very random but hilarious in its hypocrisy is about the actor who plays Amir. Amr Waked is an Egyptian actor who was super active and vocal about his support of Palestine. And when the news broke out that he was cast in the movie, so many people were upset that he betrayed the cause and willingly acted alongside Gal. His defense was that he was taking the role to help Palestine and Arabs, but the role just perpetuated racist stereotypes. And I think they said the scene in Giza and Cairo since Sinai was a bit too on the nose since it is on... Palestine borders. I'm assuming that Patty made Diana save those kids to make a statement considering Egypt is one of the few Arab countries on good terms with Israel and would allow the movie to be filmed there, end quote. Uh, for additional context, Wonder Woman 2017 is banned in several countries. Lebanon currently has conflict with Israel, bans Israeli products, and bars its citizens from traveling to Israel or having contact with Israelis. Hence, Wonder Woman 2017 was banned in Lebanon, and because of the Arab League boycott of Israel, it was also banned in Qatar and Tunisia. Additionally, Sama said this, quote, The thing about Patty's Cleopatra movie is that the announcement came just a few days after October 6, the anniversary of the war between Israel and Egypt, which is one of Egypt's very few wins against Israel. So not only was it upsetting that they're going to ruin Cleopatra, but it feels like they intentionally announced it on a day of celebration, end quote. That is a lot of information to take in, but basically the film has a lot more layers of racism now. Also, if you'd like to give additional info like Sama or send us fun little comments, you can comment on the podcast episode on YouTube, add us at Twitter at LabyrinthPod, or email us at goldenliars at gmail.com. That's goldenliars, L-Y-R-E-S, at gmail.com. We would love the opportunity to read some more listener mail in the podcast, so send us some if you'd like. <laughs> now, moving on to the main focus of the episode, which is the Jurassic Park franchise. We're going to give you a, a bit of a synopsis of the two films we're going to be discussing, Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Based on a novel by Michael Crichton, in 1993, Steven Spielberg directed the first film of what would become the Jurassic Park franchise. It follows Dr. Alan Grant, Dr. Ellie Sattler, and Ian Malcolm, who are invited to John Hammond's nearly finished theme park. When everything that could go wrong goes wrong, Grant is set to the task to protect Hammond's two grandchildren when the park's clone dinosaurs run loose. In this episode, we're only focusing on one other sequel, which was a soft reboot of the franchise in Jurassic World. The failed Jurassic Park has now become Jurassic World. As the world stands marveled by dinosaurs, they create a new attraction in order to maintain public interest, which is a genetically modified hybrid dinosaur, the Indominus Rex, which escapes containment and goes on a killing spree. Owen Grady and Claire Deering must work together in order to find Claire's nephews who have gone missing in the chaos of the park. A bit of on-screen representation in the films is B.D. Wong is a Chinese-American actor, Samuel L. Jackson is a black actor, and Irfan Khan is an Indian actor. There are some content warnings that are shared between both movies. Um, both movies have dead animals animals, jump scares, gore, and claustrophobic scenes. In Jurassic Park, there is fat phobia, and in Jurassic World, there is vomiting. So going on to our problematic cast and crew segment, although multiple cast members from both movies have arguably questionable behaviors and tone-deaf opinions, 
They will not be discussed in depth. However, Chris Pratt has concrete evidence of offensive behavior, so we will be diving into that. Just a warning, we will be mentioning white supremacy and pedophilia in the next few minutes. In 2019, Chris Pratt wore a shirt that says, don't tread on me. This is a reference to the Gadsden flag, a flag that is associated with white supremacy, guns rights, and limited government. Uh, the Gadsden flag is typically depicted on a yellow flag with a snake coiled into a spiral with the words don't tread on me below it. The shirt Chris Pratt wears has the snake, the words, and the American flag on it. One could argue that he wore the shirt out of ignorance, but it does not escape me that one, he did not respond to the backlash despite it going viral, and you know, if I was him, I wouldn't mind taking the opportunity to publicly denounce white supremacy. And two, Chris Pratt is a huge gun collector himself, owning 30 to 40 guns. Um, I'm not implying that he is a white supremacist, but he is someone who advocates for middle ground between Democrats and Republicans and pushes for that during our current political climate where there is a large amount of open and violent white supremacists. Chris Pratt is also a member of the church called Hillsong Church, which presents itself as one of those Jesus is cool churches, but is famously anti-LGBTQ+. In 2019, actor Elliot Page called Chris out on this, and he responded on an Instagram post that it wasn't true because his church welcomed him even after he was divorced. He equated his divorce to anti-queer sentiments and attempted to erase the fact that the church's website says that they welcome all lifestyles, but that they don't condone an LGBTQ plus lifestyle. This church also has many cases of pedophilia. Frank Houston, one of the founders of the church, had 10 young boys as young as 7 who came up and testified that the man was molesting them after church meetings. Also, early last year, Ricky Garcia, a former child Disney star, began to come forward and reveal all of the covering up of crimes of sexual predators in Hollywood. Ricky Garcia filed a lawsuit against Harte, his manager, for raping and forcing him to participate in other pedophilic situations. And in one of these, Ricky said that Chris Pratt and his former wife, Anna Ferris, hosted a party where minors were intoxicated and sex trafficked. Although the pedophile ring and the other allegations have gone mostly under the radar, those who have looked more into it see Pratt's strong defense of guns pedophile jokes as a sign that this allegation is entirely possible. A lot of the original resources of people speaking up about this issue have been removed. We are unaware why they've been deleted. For YouTube videos of people speaking up, it is listed as being removed for violating its rules on harassment and bullying. There's a lot more allegations, less concrete information, tone deaf and questionable social media posts and interviews from Pratt that you can read more about in the links that we provide in our show notes. But I definitely encourage you to search for more additional articles yourself. A very long but necessary segment on Chris Pratt. So before we start, I just want to point out some key differences in the book and the original film Jurassic Park because the screenwriter of the film is the author of the book. So it's oh important God. to notice. It's important to notice these changes that he makes and they're so good and I'm like, okay. Oh, sorry. oh wow. Okay. I didn't know that. That's actually one of my bullet points that I was going to bring up later because I, I didn't know. I, I didn't oh, look okay. into it. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the movie cuts out a lot of the violence in the book. The book is gory as shit. Really? It's super gory. Yes. Mm. There's a part where somebody's literally carrying their intestines because they were slashed by a dinosaur and they're like running away and it's so... Ah. Henry Wu, the doctor, he's a really big character in the book. Although a lot of his scenes are flashbacks, he's a big character. And in the movie, he, the first one, um, he's cut down to only one scene. In almost all of the films and spin-off shows, he comes back. John Hammond is literally evil incarnate in the book in the movies i'll talk about this more later but he's like oh the grandpa figure who's rich and like oh he's kind of cool because he loves dinosaurs no in the book he's described as literally only caring about rich kids who will be able to go to the park he doesn't even want his grandchildren there he was tragically forced to take care of them and he dies in the book too and dr grant also has a different viewpoint to children in the movie he's very anti-kids but in the book he loves kids because he's like they're the only people who are genuinely interested in dinosaurs and i love that he loves them he loves talking about to little kids about dinosaurs those are the main things i'll connect back to them as we talk i just wanted to point that out i love it when media gets to be changed in another format because like when you adapt something you have the opportunity to like kind of tweak things mm -hmm. um that you wish you could go back and fix and that that it was the original author that just that's just means so much to me, you know? Uh. <laughs> yeah, because even though the book is really good, like, I recommend the book. Mm -hmm. You can tell he, the changes that he made in the movie are very significant and they add more to the overall theme of the story and it's just, ugh. Yeah. 
Michael, the, you yeah. did so good. <laughs> there's a reason why I think a lot of adaptations are sometimes better than the source material or they're like really good, um, you know, separately. Um, but mm-hmm. I love like when they change, ma- they change it thematically or they change the story and the characters or whatever. And it really adds to the new material. Ah, that's just really cool. Nice. All right. So let's get into Jurassic Park first. What do you think about the movie? Just generally. Oh, (laughs) Um, there was actually a story which really surprised me. Last time I watched it was definitely on a VHS when it wasn't (laughs) too obsolete for me to still own a VHS player. Um, So and, and Jurassic World is more recent. So that was more fresh in my mind. So then when I watched Jurassic Park... I was really shocked at how much story there was. And I thought it was mostly dinosaurs and no plot based on what I had seen in Jurassic World. No, it's so good. It's just one of my favorite films ever. Yeah, I actually really love it, rewatching it now. It's really good, isn't it? Yeah, (laughs) yeah, I entirely agree. I mean, I was really excited for this episode, uh, rewatching it for this episode, because I was like, oh, I haven't seen this in a really long time. I remember liking it, um, and I like dinosaurs. And then I was like, wait, this is actually intellectually stimulating. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. This is one of my favorite movies. I rewatch this movie a lot, especially with my nieces. We watched Camp Cretaceous last weekend. It's a spinoff show for kids. And we're oh, like, dinosaurs. Cute. Are they so, learning the names they... of dinosaurs too? Yes, they know oh, the names of dinosaurs. I, I, maybe this is like the equivalent of Land Before Time for this generation. The film is about dinosaurs and that's obvious. But there are there's a conversation that Michael's trying to have about money and technology together and how progress is getting involved with money and technology and he poses the question and is what we consider progress something we should be blindly striving for he dissects this question with john and alan who represent two different ways of thinking dr grant he's a paleontologist (laughs) john hanneman is just a rich white man well they're both white men but he's rich (laughs) and Before we get into it, I wanted to talk about what capitalism is, and I'm going to give a dictionary definition, and I'm going to give an example in extremely watered-down terms. So, dictionary definition. An economic system characterized by private or corporate ownership of capital goods, by investments that are determined by private decision and by prices, production, and the distribution of goods that are determined mainly by competition in the free market. So, capitalistic structure in our Western society is deeply flawed and will not be sustainable in the long run for anybody. We're seeing the rich get richer and the amount of people living below the poverty level increase. The easiest and my favorite example of how to explain capitalism to someone is you're making a paper airplane and the paper costs 10 cents. The amount of effort you put into the paper airplane costs 40 cents. Therefore, the production costs 50 cents. So if you sell it to somebody, you would sell it for 50 cents and you would earn whatever your production back. But you made it in a friend's house and they're telling you, oh, the paper airplane is no longer yours, it's mine because you made it in my house. And so they take the paper airplane, they sell it for a dollar, but they pay you only 10 cents. And basically, the person creating the paper airplane are the workers and the your friend's house is the bosses who just keep on getting rich off the labor of their workers and they're not getting paid fairly. There, mm-hmm. There's my capitalism <laughs> <laughs> intro. Uh, okay. I, just, I also want to just highlight um, something that you said to make sure the audience remembers this for our future discussion on Jurassic World, but capitalism encourages mass consumption and unsustainability, uh, which again is really important for a Jurassic World discussion. So keep that in your brain. Let's get into it with my favorite boy, Dr. Alan Grant, played by Sam Neill. He's your favorite? <laughs> no, but I love <laughs> okay. that he loves dinosaurs. Okay. <laughs> He's the most dinosaur knowledgeable person in the show. So yeah, yeah, I, he well, is. Show, movie. So, in the film, we're introduced, basically, immediately, with him hating a kid. He's God. so mad at a kid who's in his, um, what's it called? Like a tour his, or something. Yeah, he's really mad. He's annoyed as fuck. And that's different to us. I said earlier, in the book, he loves children. So, this change is important to know. This man hates children. Yes, he does. And constantly, we see different the scenes of it. Um, when the little boy tries to get into the car with him, he's yeah. so... He's so excited to be with his idol, his dinosaur idol. And he's like, oh, shit. No, get away from me, little boy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. And, like, I get it was because, like, he doesn't want to have kids. 
but mm-hmm. um hate hollywood i i have to tell you something people who don't want kids are still nice to kids yeah not wanting not wanting kids doesn't mean you're an asshole okay literally <laughs> Li- oh. i like i saw this and i was like ah yes the stereotype that if you don't want kids it means you hate them and it's like um no nope, that's not how that works not wanting kids and being an asshole is not synonymous <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we don't want kids. <laughs> we don't. And we're but not we're assholes. Be nice. so I don't think I'm an asshole anyway. <laughs> I hope you're not. I don't think I'm an asshole either, but okay. So this is one of his biggest transformations in the film. Like children in the film are seen as progress, the future. They're representing of a future and everything that comes with it. And that means technology because Lex, the little girl, she's uh, the tech whiz. And in the book, it's the little boy who's the tech whiz. But so basically the children are given the representation of technology. And throughout Alan's character arc, we see him not caring for the kids to being forced to take care of them in a situation of life or death. And seeing him bond with them and actually want them to survive. <clears throat> And it's like, it happens really quickly. Like, from one moment he hates him and then another moment he's like, oh, I'll protect you. Like, let's cuddle in a tree and watch this dinosaur eat yeah. from our hands. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that life, mm-hmm. it's that life-threatening situation yeah. that suddenly changes but him. it presents him to growing to accept the possibility of having the future. Kids. He, oh, yeah, that too. Yeah, <laughs> and having kids. Yeah, I have to mention this, but a lot of these books talk about, like, growing to accept the fact that you want kids, and it's really weird to me, but anywho. That's back, an agenda that they're pushing back then. That is an agenda. And uh, they're still pushing but it today. They still did in Jurassic World. We'll get to that, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. So annoying. But, like, he's just growing to accept the future because, okay, as his career is focused on staying in the past, learning about the past, not really caring for future developments as long as he gets to learn about dinosaurs. And in the first scene, again, not only does he have a conflict with a little boy, he has a conflict with technology that he's given because he doesn't understand what it's going on. And he tries to be like, oh, I don't understand what it, this is, but I'm so cool. Like... I'm cool for not understanding technology. <laughs> it's so weird. But a lot of people have that mentality. But at the end of the film, we see that Lex's knowledge with of technology is what ends up saving them for a moment when the velociraptors are trying to get in and she somehow hacks into the system mm-hmm. and puts the locks. So this entire plot presents Dr. Alan Grant as somebody who first to stay in the past. His fear of the future is slowly taken away with the kids and technology saving them. So there's a round table scene in Jurassic Park uh, where where they have a discussion on each other's professional opinions on the park. Um, and it was really, it's a really awesome scene and I love it so much. I was not expecting a scene like that. Obviously as a kid, that shit flew over my head. But like, cause like I wanted to see the cool dinosaurs. I thought it was, yeah, like, yeah you know, dinosaurs. Uh, but the dialogue in that scene is phenomenal. So Dr. Alan Grant, hand in hand with Dr. Ellie Sattler, uh, were speaking to the social sciences in that scene. Um, basically, us humans have adapted to an ever-changing world. We've adapted to culture, to our ecosystem, our food um, over the past thousands of years. Billions of years, whatever the fuck. No, not billions, it's dinosaurs. <laughs> my bad, my bad, my bad. <laughs> um, over the past thousands of years, uh, the dinosaurs have skipped that natural progress of evolution, um, that how they will react to this new world is unpredictable, and there is a question to how or if they can adapt to a world where humans are no longer beings with short lifespans who live in caves and primarily live their day-to-day life hunting and fulfilling their other basic needs. Animals today know to avoid cars, avoid roads, and, you know, we've seen, like, viral videos of city animals using the fucking crosswalks, which is wild. Mm -hmm. Um, So these animals have slowly adapted to our way of life, but that cannot be said for these dinosaurs who were just, like, genetically modified to suddenly be part of our ecosystem now which oh my god that seemed so good Raya. you don't understand i was just like oh i kept rewinding it because it was so good <laughs> this movie's just so uh, it's so big brain 
It is. And people just look at it as just a dinosaur movie. A dinosaur I'm like, no, movie, it's a yeah. big brain dinosaur movie. <laughs> it's not just a dinosaur movie. Um, just as the dinosaurs are facing challenges to adapt and struggling to face reality with humans, which is shocking to them because I don't think they existed when humans existed. So it's so weird for them. They're scared. They're being challenged on their authority. They, they're going to have to adapt and kill all humans. It just is what it is. But Dr. Alan Grant is also facing his own problems with adapting to society as it evolves. He doesn't want to evolve. He's kind of stuck like the dinosaurs, but is forced to do so by the situation and the other characters that he faces. The main one is the opposite of Dr. Alan Grant, basically. He loves kids. He In the film, he wants to do this part so the kids can enjoy dinosaurs. And he doesn't mention that it's just for rich kids in the film. He just mentions, oh, it's for kids everywhere in the world to enjoy dinosaurs. And he brings his grandchildren. He loves them. And he's presented as this pro-progress person compared to Dr. Alan Grant, who's anti-progress. He wants to create a future where there's new things constantly where he could benefit from, which is capitalism basically creating a more challenging free market. And so when we see his relationship with his grandchildren, he cares for them a lot, but he is forced to be in a position where he can't protect them. Even with all the technology he installed on the island, even with all the control he thought he had, it's gone. He doesn't know anything. And I don't know if you noticed, but one line in the film that is repeated constantly is, we spared no expense. Oh my god, yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, he thinks that with money and the investments he puts onto dinosaurs, that they're going to this situation that he has created is going to react the same way as a free market in a capitalistic society does. That the dinosaurs are going to somehow work for him in order to provide him revenue. Mm. But as Ian Malcolm says, like, they're dinosaurs. The worst thing is going to happen. Chaos is going to happen. Like, you can't control something that we have never interacted with and they have Mm -hmm. never interacted with us. That's a really good point. I didn't, I didn't analyze him that much, so... That's a really good point. I didn't notice that, yeah. The only reason I feel like I like his character... No, I don't like his character. Mm. I like his development. Mm. I like his Mm -hmm. development is because I had read the book. I've recently read the book. It was like a few months ago. And I noticed all the differences. I was like, wow, Michael, you were wanting to say something. Let me look into (laughs) it. (laughs) But basically, in Act 2, he liked the control technology and money gave him and he was stripped of it and it was threatening to kill everything he loves basically his grandchildren and mm-hmm. he had no control and in act three he realizes the cost of progress is too high sometimes yeah, yeah. that it risks everything he loves and it creates this super interesting question of like when we go back to the theme is everything we call progress actually progress michael says like i don't know like <laughs> Dr. Alan Grant still faced a lot of hardship by staying in the past and only by evolving slightly towards the future was he able to survive. But we also see that his wariness of evolving too fast in the d- bad direction is has a good found. Yeah, it has consequences. Yeah. John Hammond, he's also faced to question, like, is his progress a good thing? And he realizes, like, no, like, I almost lost my grandchildren. I almost lost my own life. And he goes through this development of realizing, like, oh, maybe this wasn't something that was good, a direction where I was heading with progress. Mm -hmm. Like, I thought Mm -hmm. I had control over it, and I don't. So he doesn't give us a specific answer, but he poses, like, this question, like, here you go. There's no right answer. We have to learn how to live with that and adapt to the Mm -hmm. situations given to us, which I think is really smart, Michael. Good job. Yeah, I mean, I'm not up to date on current science in our world, but I'm sure there are, this could be applicable to like yeah. some scientists are going in the wrong direction uh, when they should be applying their skills, skills and resources to uh, something else that will benefit everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I also agree. I liked him as a character. Um, he's dynamic enough where his drive towards progress and indirectly capitalism isn't entirely unredeemable um Mm -hmm. whereas characters in jurassic world are so on the nose and stuck in their character archetypes um he feels like a person who makes mistakes and can recognize his mistakes um, and learn from it um not just a character in a story 
And that's the thing about Jurassic Park characters. Like, you're given, like, people who do evil things, but it allows them to have room to adapt still. Like, mm-hmm. as we're going back to adapt, mm-hmm. the humans can adapt. It's saying that. But Jurassic World is just like, <laughs> they're shitty and they're gonna stay shitty till they yeah. get eaten. <laughs> yeah. Which isn't, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, there was some gratification from that, but it's not, Yeah. it sets a different tone from what Jurassic Park is. <laughs> okay, so I just want to talk a little bit about my favorite characters plural <laughs> dr ellie settler and dr ian malcolm they're so good oh, i'm blushing oh, okay <laughs> okay mm-hmm. dr. interesting ellie settler. stop mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. she's a paleobotanist so basically she studies the plant life that was alive during the dinosaur stuff the dinosaur stuff <laughs> dinosaur time the jurassic the era. jurassic time yeah the, <laughs> literally in the title i was like waiting for you to be like ah oh, yes jurassic prehistoric okay, um, times she is beautiful <laughs> okay okay sorry I just i'll let I'll, I'll just be quiet and listen to you uh let this just let it out i need to uh, let it out for yeah go I ahead. love go her ahead. i love how she dresses i love how she's not she just loves dinosaur poop no <laughs> just kidding She's really passionate about what she does, that she's not afraid to stick her hands into dinosaur poop, which nobody has ever done before. And she's like, wow. Wow. Hashtag wife. Okay. Hey, I'm girl boss writers. (laughs) Take notes, please. (laughs) Her character, as we get to the closing of the film, interacts a lot with John Hammond's character, and she questions him a lot about, like, why he did this. Are you sure Mm -hmm. about this? And she's the one who, like, brings john hammond back to like to the ground like his feet were in the clouds and she's like do you not realize we could lose the people we love because of your island like dr ellen grant is shown that they kind of want a relationship between each other ellen grant and ellie settler which is weird because in the book at least a grad student that works with ellen grant and he's much much older than her but (laughs) yeah but they aged her up in the film and they made her a doctor already so She's not a grad student Ah, uh, yes, because they didn't want to have this weird... <laughs> uh, they didn't want to follow this pedophile agenda that Hollywood nope. typically follows. Nope. Okay. She's also the character that, before the events at Jurassic Park started, is wanting to get Alan to progress a little bit. Like, she wants kids. She wants to move on in life. She likes the kid at the beginning. She's like, Alan, don't be mean. Stop it. <laughs> So she is the character that voices concern for the behavior of dinosaurs and the issues of trying to control something we do not understand. Mm -hmm. Um, She brings up it is an extinct ecosystem, um, therefore we don't know what to expect. And to reiterate what I said earlier, bringing back prehistoric dinosaurs and plants entirely shifts our ecosystem and can potentially harm it well i'm sure it it will harm it because they're like invasive species kind of i mean they are supposed to stay on the island but you can't really control that sort of thing i'm sure something is bound to leave the island and Mm -hmm. grow or live um elsewhere and then that will be an invasive species although the movie does not mention it in the book there's a series of scenes that um, follow um little velociraptors who escape the island throughout the what's going on in the book so uh-huh. they have already escaped the island. You know, I love the Jurassic Park franchise, but the only movie I like is Jurassic Park, so... <laughs> yeah, after that, it becomes like yeah. a money-making machine. Yeah, which is funny. <laughs> I, I love when movies are about capitalism, and then people <laughs> tweet afterwards, where's the second movie? And it's like, did you not see that this movie was about capitalism? Or, yeah. like, I don't know. <laughs> and then the creators are like bet we'll make it <laughs> i'm sure it wasn't the creators i'm sure it was the executives who were kind of like hey th- we can we can make this intellectual property we can make money out of this and make mm-hmm. more movies and make merchandise and blah 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 dr ian malcolm he dies in the book he's he's gone and they only kept him oh, alive really? in the movie so they could do a sequel Ugh, dumb yeah he's death in the book was so important because he was like the rational one the one who Mm -hmm. was thinking logically he's like why the fuck are we on an island with dinosaurs like this Mm -hmm. is not normal Mm -hmm. like because he's a mathematician who focuses on chaos theory which is basically saying like if something can go wrong it will go wrong like there's always gonna be something going wrong because we can't control this and meaning we're not gonna be able to ensure that 
the ending we want is going to happen. So therefore, something will go wrong. Yeah, and I was very surprised uh, right off the bat. He immediately questions the park mm-hmm. and the consequences it inherits. And I was mm-hmm. like, wow, this character is very He's well so grounded. Good. I love it. It's one of the reasons I like Dr. Ellie Sattler and Dr. Ian Malcolm because they're like questioning. Mm-hmm. Ian Malcolm, strangely, is also a character who questions Alan's desire to have kids or the lack thereof. Because in the scene, um, before the dinosaur attacks and they're in the car talking to each other, Alan randomly turns to him and is like, do you have kids? And... Ian Malcolm is like, yeah, I have three. I love them so much. So we're seeing like this this character who was flirting freely with Ellie and like had a lot of charm with her. And Alan was uncomfortable because he doesn't have that with Ellie right now. Like they're like in a fight. And he's like, oh, look, this man likes kids. I wonder why. Alan is being challenged, basically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he's risking losing ellie if he doesn't adapt ian represents like somebody who could take away ellie from alan and he's forced to realize like how far am i gonna go in order to keep ellie in my life like is this something i should really be considering and at the end we see that yes he is considering having kids he's fine with the idea of having kids because on an airplane he's hugging the little kids and he smiles at ellie and he's like yeah i'm ready beach <laughs> <laughs> I love that these two characters are just, like, breaking down Dr. Ellen Grant and John Hammond. And it's like, oh, you guys are so powerful. And you guys are so cool. And you dress so cool. And, oh. Mm -hmm. I I want to dress like Ian Malcolm. (laughs) I want to dress like Spike from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But I guess we we can't have everything we want, (laughs) Rhea. And you just had to bring us Spike, huh? (laughs) Yeah, I did. (laughs) I mean, I had to, kind of. Um, I've loved him for so long and he's he's back in my life after like six years of nothing. Me with redacted. Who is this? I'm not gonna say. It starts with a J and it's four letters. Oh, please, someone figure this out. They start, they start with a J and it's four letters. Redacted. Um, I, feel like, I feel like it's something from Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings character. Hold on, hold on. Stop, Lord of stop. The Rings characters. <laughs> I feel like, no, maybe it was the Hobbit. I don't, I don't think know. you're going to be able to find this character. It's okay. It starts with a J. Someone help me. I need to know. Going like back to Jurassic Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Going back to <laughs> Jurassic Park. Um, I thought it was very interesting uh, when I was first introduced to Dr. Ian Malcolm. Uh, because, like I said, I haven't watched this movie in a really long time. And when people talked about this character, they only really mentioned that he was extremely attractive and so i kind of assumed that he was a character who was he was a character whose main purpose was like to be man candy for the audience you know and then uh he shows up and he's asking all these intellectual questions and i'm like oh my god he is actually a very good character and i love him yeah okay but i feel like a lot of Jurassic, the conversation around Jurassic Park um, is focused either on dinosaurs or the attractiveness of the characters in the film. Mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. they erase the conversation that's happening, which is like the reason I find these characters attractive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, God, you're missing the point here. <laughs> this is why we have Jurassic World, tragically. Uh, yeah, I know. Um, so going back to the round table scene... Um, mm-hmm. that I mentioned earlier from Dr. Alan Grant. I- I'm g- I'm just going to like read some quotes cuz like ahead, I rewatched the movie, well I rewatched that scene and I was like writing down all these quotes and I was like, "Damn, this is so good." So, Dr. Ian Malcolm says, "Quote, the lack of humility before nature that's being displayed here staggers me." And I was like, "Whoa! Oh my god, that's Dude. so good." Oh. And then and then he also says, he also says, okay, genetic power is the most awesome force the planet's ever seen, but you wield it like a kid that's found his dad's gun. And I was like, oh shit! He's like mic dropping John Hammond right now. And the problem with the power that John Hammond obtained was that, quote, it didn't require any discipline to attain it. You read what others had done and you took the next step. You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves. So you don't take any responsibility for it. And it's like Mm -hmm. the Spider-Man quote, right? With great power Ah! comes great responsibility. And he didn't earn the power. So he will not handle it with care and be cautious of the possible consequences. 
I hope you read the book, Elia. I actually looked at my library hoping for an audiobook, but it doesn't have an audiobook and I don't want to read it. It's such a good book. I want to reread it. I feel so convinced to buy the physical copy so I can bookmark it. Um, yeah, and so one of my notes was like, was this the author of the book or the screenwriter of the movie? And like you mentioned that they were mm-hmm. the same person. So now I'm just like, whoever the writer is, just like, I want to congratulate. I want to shake your hand and just congratulate congratulate you on your beautiful beautiful literally work in both the book and the movie even though i haven't read the book but i'm sure it's just mm-hmm. as amazing and this is such like this scene alone is just so amazing i want to like tape it to my <laughs> wall and write it on my forehead i just like oh my god it's just so good and i want the world to just like bask in the glory <laughs> of this wonderful intellectual conversation it's just so now. phenomenal oh my god yeah every t- every time i listen to the theme song i want to rewatch the movie because the theme so song good. is that fucking good before we finish our conversation on jurassic park i wanted to mention that dr henry Wu. he is an extremely minor character in the film but in reality in the book we find out he's the reason why um dinosaurs have amphibian dna he's like the brains of why dinosaurs exist but he's reduced to something like very marginal you know i think this is racism yes i think that's why it is. <laughs> i just think it's racism oh my god even the way they handle samuel l jackson i was like bro i had I no idea he was and he was movie. a big character <gasps> he was also a big character in the book i just remembered really yeah, yeah. Bro, racism and then the fact that they brought back dr henry Wu for jurassic world and then his role was so his role was to be a villain, and also he was still a minor character. I was like, this is racist. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to mention it later, but in Cap Cretaceous, they do the exact same thing. He's a minor character, but he's the villain. Uh, before before we head over to Jurassic World, I just I just want to ask, out of curiosity, do you have any fond memories with this movie? Like, childhood memories? Mm. No. <laughs> no? <laughs> what? I'm so shocked. No, I wasn't the biggest dinosaur fan when i was little i was more lord of the rings dinosaur is oh, new now but mm. i do remember we have this we still have it we have a vhs of the movie and it has one of those covers that when you move it it changes the picture so in one mm-hmm. of the mm-hmm. things it shows like the jurassic park and when you move it it's like the t-rex launching towards you and i would love it so much i would play with it i would be like yeah T-rex i have that for me. the second one i think oh <laughs> yeah do you have fond memories Yes, I do. That's why I wanted to ask you if you oh, had fond memories. I don't. Oh, that sucks. Lord <laughs> of the you. Rings. Lord of the Rings. Lord I of do. the Rings. I dressed, what the fuck? I was dressed up as a hobbit as a child. <laughs> as a hobbit? Wow. Yes. You're not short enough to be a hobbit, Raya. As a child, I was. <laughs> oh, you're right. <laughs> no, yeah, I... Yeah, I definitely grew up with this movie. Um, there was an after-school daycare at my uh, my kindergarten through eighth grade, and this was like at a time where there wasn't so much of a disconnect with age differences. You know, like mm-hmm. I feel nowadays, like eighth graders wouldn't be caught dead in the same room as like a fourth or fifth grader. You know, so the daycare definitely played this movie multiple times. Uh, but in this specific memory, it was raining. And they put the movie on for like 30 kids and we were all bunched up in this small daycare (laughs) center and they turned off the lights and there were snacks. And then when it came to like the scary kitchen scene, I remember like either one of the workers or like an eighth grader who volunteered to do it would like take all the young kids outside. Uh, which included me and uh, we would have to wait outside the building for the kitchen scene to end because it was too scary for people (laughs) and I remember like when the kitchen scene was coming up they would be like okay I I feel like it was like fourth grade and below they would be like okay you and you and you have to go outside and someone be like no I'm a fifth grader now I can stay (laughs) and it was like I just remember that memory and like and I remember huddling underneath like the small door canopy because it was raining um, and hearing like all the screaming from inside side and it's like the memory I don't remember sitting there and watching the movie but I remember the atmosphere of like this little daycare center and just like and how invested we all were collectively um despite like all the age gaps and I feel like that's not really something that kids can get nowadays just because like you know kids don't go to daycares anymore <laughs> that's true especially since they don't go to school anymore <laughs> oh yeah that it's yeah virtual. also we are in a pandemic <laughs> that's also true but oh, yeah that's such a that's fun cool. memory of mine yeah i would love to see jurassic park while it's raining so jurassic world before we get into everything else that goes on in this film i wanted to mention the f- things that i liked 
and that I actually thought were really good in comparison to other Jurassic Park sequels because they're all trash. Yeah. <laughs> this film is one of the only one that goes back to the core of the film, which is theme park with dinosaurs. And I think that's why it was the best sequel that we've had so far because that's the part we want to see. Like the the part about the dinosaurs, people going and visiting dinosaurs. The other films, it's like, oh, they go to an island and it's been overrun by dinosaurs. We know what we're going into, but this is something that is genuinely more terrifying, I think. We're not going into like open dinosaur land. It's going to a place where people think they're safe and it ends up not being so. I like that it goes back to the roots of it being in the park and dinosaurs. That's what I like about it. <laughs> My general thought about this movie is that it is a total genre shift. It's like a disaster movie, like Sharknado, mm-hmm. and it's also <laughs> part monster movie, like King Kong. Oh, gosh. Wait, wait, wait. The Indominus Rex is one of them? <laughs> no, 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 no. Listen, 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 listen. It's a disaster monster movie like Godzilla. <gasps> oh my god. <laughs> Y'all should watch it. Godzilla vs. Kong. It comes out in March. Godzilla wins. Yes, Godzilla <laughs> wins. And if he dies... Um, no, he didn't. I, no, he didn't. Yeah, he didn't <laughs> die. He didn't die. Kong has nothing against Godzilla. The best thing about this movie... The best thing about this movie... Okay, this, is, this is a positive... Kind of mm-hmm. positive note. The best thing about this movie is that it is an advertisement for the Universal Studios theme park. It literally <laughs> makes me want to go to it so bad. You have no idea. <laughs> like, the entrance of their theme park with all the shops and restaurants, that's literally what Universal Studios looks like. And, like, and they have, like, all this other cool shit, like kayaking with dinosaurs and the petting zoo that's and the so hamster ball. Cool. And I'm like, they got really creative advertising possible rides for, like, the future when technology can actually do that. And I would love mm-hmm. to see that in a theme park. And I was like, wow, this mm-hmm. is a great ad. I would love to go to Jurassic Park. I Yes, Jurassic I would love World. that. I would yeah. love that. Um, and I honestly, like, I feel like it could be kind of doable. It could be. It could be kind of doable, be. you know? Um, like, as long as you guys don't go too far into, like, money grabs, like, it could be safe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Don't do the Indominus Rex, yeah. obviously. I mean, like, okay, so, like, this is going to be, like, kind of... But, like, <laughs> so there's a new ride. Hey, this is editing Elia speaking. Um, I ended up talking about theme parks for nine minutes straight. Um, as soon as I finished talking, Rhea and I knew that this was going to be cut from the episode, but it was, it, it was funny and passionate enough that we knew we wanted to keep it somehow. Um, so a bonus, a bonus clip or a bonus segment, I don't know what to call it, uh, will be released sometime soon after this episode releases so comparing it to jurassic park the theme of jurassic park as we said earlier is everything we call progress actually progress in jurassic world is um it it's not much of a question it's more like it discusses human error and the perception we have of control and how capitalism fosters like a desire for everything bigger and newer and more powerful and the consequences of it but it kind of destroys the first film's progress that I made with certain characters. And there wasn't any thematic conversation with the characters. It's ironic because they're capitalizing on nostalgia for both dinosaurs and then the mm-hmm. Jurassic franchise. And then pushing mm-hmm. for it in the reboots by making everything bigger and newer, which you mentioned. And like I remember mm-hmm. when the first trailer came out, there was an emphasis on the back that jurassic was bad the dinosaurs are bigger the park is bigger the dinosaurs are new because they're genetically (laughs) modified and you can also see like the parallel to the films itself when like when i rewatched jurassic park i remember everything from that movie but i was shocked at how small the climax felt um it was Mm -hmm. like an excellent climax of course but it was on a much smaller scale and it focused on a handful of people whereas jurassic world it's like big dinosaurs and there's so many people and death and also because of that you lack the thematics of horror 
and emotional connection to the characters. You feel significantly more disconnected with them, which is Mm -hmm. straying from the topic of this conversation, but, like, I can point out 500 reasons why the Ryu lacks a spark (laughs) that Jurassic Park has. Okay, more capitalism. (laughs) Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. (sighs) Because, okay, listen, I just, I, I absolutely hate product placement in newer films like it's just it's the one thing that just takes me out immediately and i just get so pissed off so literally in the first 12 minutes they're making corny jabs at capitalism uh the thing about capitalism right is mass consumption and unsustainability Mm -hmm. and in the first 12 minutes they say consumers want bigger dinosaurs and more teeth and then they make a deal with verizon in the movie and then say pepsisaurus and tostito don and then notice all these paid advertisements right and there's also some close-up shots of beats headphones and converse shoes Mm -hmm. six minutes into the fucking movie just ad after ad after ad which isn't bad because you know all movies do it but there's just there was just so much in literally the span of 12 minutes it was just hugely ironic considering jurassic's roots in anti-capitalism and it's not just, like, the first few minutes of the film. It spans throughout the entire film. Exactly. Like, when they get to the final moment where they're, like, it's the T-Rex fighting the Indominus Rex with the Velociraptors. You can see Starbucks in the background. You see, like, this yes, other restaurant yes. in the background. It's like, okay. There's shots of um, gift shops. And you mm-hmm. can see, like, specific products that they're selling. And that they actually sell those products in real life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And, like, also nostalgia. Um, the worker wearing the Jurassic Park shirt and the references yes, and to that, the previous hey, movies. Hey, you know who yes, that I worker know who that is? is. Ah, I know who he is. Nick Miller. And He's New Girl. He's dinosaur boy. <laughs> okay, yes. Nick Miller's my favorite character from um, New Girl. That's why I love him. Mm-hmm. So I love him in this film. Just wanted to mention that. <laughs> like, I know that Jurassic World is a continuation, but this series, like all series, if looked at independently from the first franchise it should be able to stand on its own but instead it is heavily dependent on being able to ride on the back of a very well-established money-making property and i hate the irony of the capitalism behind this movie <laughs> yeah oh when i was um re-watching jurassic world i kept on thinking about um watchmen the series mm. And I was like, okay, this series, if Watchmen, the original comic and the movie did not exist, this could stand on its own. Yeah, exactly. Like, it still is really good, but it still introduces, like, the background and how the original series affected this, but it's still its own series. Mm -hmm. That's where Jurassic Park and Jurassic World failed because they did not establish how society has been affected with Jurassic World park like what do people think about dinosaurs what do people think the only thing we know is that she um claire deering says to the worker who's wearing um jurassic park shirt and she's like that's really distasteful to wear here Mm -hmm. and i'm like here so it's just here that it affected like the world did not have a reaction to this yeah like okay i would actually be very interested in yeah what the rest of the like, world like are there people who are anti-jurassic world like are there people who like are worried mm-hmm. is there anybody a fear of like are you telling me this huge scientific discovery did not have a humongous cultural impact on the world i Literally. would love to know about that and it annoys me that the only impact that it shows that w- there is is milita- militarization of dinosaurs, which we'll talk more later, but like... Ugh, military. And they do it... I, I have not seen the sequel to Jurassic World, but I know the plot of it. And it's basically doubling on that fact about how like there's some like Russian scheme to get dinosaurs. And I it's watched like, what it the and I don't fuck? remember it at all. I only watched it because Justice Smith is in it and I wanted to support him. Oh. <laughs> I would watch it too because of him. But it's like, okay, if you're going to cash grab on the statue, you might as well integrate Jurassic Park in a way that establishes a universe. Mm-hmm. But you didn't. Oh, yeah. All they, all they did was like, oh, the kids are lost in the woods and they found the old yeah. Jurassic Park facility. Well, like, and I was like, great. Is this is great. What the fuck? Fuck. it's just a wasted opportunity for world building yeah and that's like hey the- if you're Ugh. if you're gonna do capitalism at least do it right come on at least world build it <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is like it's one of the th- things that most annoys me of this film like you had a amazing opportunity for world building you could have done it like watchmen the series where it's like it's integrated into the humanity's mindset like this fear or like this or like a disregard depending on who you were at that time like and they didn't 
They didn't. Like, fuck, people were eaten by dinosaurs. If this happened in our society right now, like, there would be news, there would still be fear. People would be wary about a new park Mm -hmm. for a Jurassic World. Like, how did they convince people? Explain this to me. Mm -hmm. Or you could, you know, have Jurassic World be a well-established theme park and maybe go into, like, well, I mean, obviously this is going to connect back to the first movie, which obviously they didn't care about, but, like, connecting back to, um the legality of fucking messing around with genetics, you know? There's a bunch of muddied area right here with uh, scientific ethics and laws and animal rights, which they brought up very briefly, um, just to mention that, oh, well, dinosaurs don't have animal rights, therefore we can abuse them, which I was like, Mm -hmm. this is a terrible way to introduce that topic, but okay. Okay, so Jurassic Park ends, like, on a... The movie ends on a hopeful note. Mm-hmm. But in the book, you can see, like, this is going to have big consequences on society. Mm-hmm. The people who were on the, the park uh, in the book end up trapped on an island because the military is questioning them. Like, society is reacting to this, and so they want to have control over the situation. So, basically, there was a disaster in Jurassic Park. Maybe you could have said, like, it was kept on the download. Maybe that's why people are going to Jurassic World. And if it wasn't kept on load and we know people were killed, why would society want a bigger and stronger dinosaur with more teeth? Like, I know people are fucked up. I I know this. (laughs) And I know society's fucked up, but, like, logically, I feel like there will be a lot of backlash. And they never mention any backlash that Jurassic World receives. They only mention, Mm -hmm. like, oh, people want more. It seems to be universally accepted. Missed opportunity. Oh, I I do want to... I do want to mention, though, um, because I did say that they don't, like, talk about the culture outside of Jurassic World, but I, in the second movie, there was, like, there's, like, a black market auction for um, a dinosaur because they, they, there's a culture of rich people uh, consuming dinosaurs, uh, which I guess oh, is... What the int- fuck? Yeah, yeah. I believe that's what it was. Uh, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess that's... I would like to see more of that sort of things in the film series. I've seen a lot of people say like, oh, I would love to be part of the the writing in Jurassic Park franchise. And I'm like, I'm not qualified enough for it. But then looking at Jurassic World, mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm more qualified than them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just so... And look, I I don't hate the screenwriter. I, I, I get it. You got a job and this is yeah. what they told you yeah. to do. Um, I hate the people who wanted this franchise yeah. to go in this direction. Yeah, that's true. Not to shit on no the screen shame. writer. <laughs> no, it's not true. your fault, buddy. Owen Grady! Going to fucking Owen Grady, the worst fucking character in the Jurassic Park franchise. Oh my god. In my humble opinion. <laughs> okay, can we talk about how his character goes through no character arc? He learns nothing. He's proven right in everything. Everything he says is right. Like, what kind of a boring-ass character arc is this? If the character... Um, were introduced as the main character Mm -hmm. has been right all along and they're not questioned in any way like okay what the fuck yeah there's no character development the only character development is in claire and it's a bad character yeah it's very bad character development. very bad character development. pushing an agenda about women i get it yes oh gosh like is this a hallmark movie or something (laughs) like please i think one of the reasons why it lacks those thematic discussions that we had in Jurassic Park is because the characters have different professions Mm -hmm. and were written in a different purpose. Owen is an animal trainer um, and he's there for the purpose of having a discussion on animal behavior and animal abuse sort of because they want to use dinosaurs for eco-terrorism and military use. And then Claire, played by... And then Claire just represents businesses and capitalism. Mm -hmm. And so they put all the scientific perspectives into one character, which is Owen, uh, which then doesn't allow the story to have a lot of those scientific discussions that Jurassic Park was set up to have. Mm -hmm. So instead, you just have one man who carries himself like, I'm smarter than you, and I told you so. And it's just like very, very sexist towards Claire. Because in the end, she's the only character that was like wrong the entire time. He's constantly like, for some reason, bringing up the fact she has heels, which is very hilarious to me also. But the fact that he keeps on bringing it up is so annoying. And she's, like, running with her high heels. It's supposed to be girl power moment. Do you remember that scene where she ties her shirt and, like, pushes up her boobs for some reason? Yes. And is like, I'm ready. That like, was... Okay. He was like, what was that supposed to mean? And she was like, I'm ready. 
Oh my god. Who, like, what why? Is this? Hey, this I'm not I'm not thing. mad at the screenwriter for the direction this film was going, but I am mad about the uh, sexism in the movie. Um, mm-hmm. I'm gonna make sure I make that clear. <laughs> going from a everybody's questioning everybody, and there's like lots of perspectives on science and technology and progressivism, and then all of a sudden it's like Owen, who represents science, is actually always right in the film. Mm-hmm. It's only the progressives like Claire Deering who are wrong, and it just takes away from all the themes in the first film. Like, how can you destroy such a smart built up for a conversation? Mm -hmm. So they made Claire this independent woman to like, I don't know, be this girl power moment for the audience. Um, But the way the movie is set up, it just tears that down. They because Owen Mm -hmm. Grady is literally there to um, tell her she's wrong constantly and make her realize that like her entire persona is just bad and i'm like i don't really get this character arc for her but basically at the end of the film it shows her completely like almost giving in into owen ideology Mm -hmm. there's no um questioning of his ideology and it's just her entering that and how that's represented is the fact that she suddenly likes kids Mm -hmm. but it's not the liking of kids of how ian malcolm did it's more like oh, she's ready to stop her entire career and have kids Mm. for Owen. Like, if Claire was a man instead of a woman, I feel like it would play out in a less problematic way. But because she's a Mm -hmm. woman, they frame it in a way where it's like, because she is in this sort of CEO position, she has to be cold-hearted, she doesn't have time for uh, personal relationships. um, Mm -hmm. And this man is telling her that like hey you know your lifestyle is bad and actually you just need to abandon your job and uh reconnect with your family because apparently women can't manage a ceo job and also be friendly and have relationships Mm -hmm. with people and it's so funny because in the jurassic park franchise kids represent the future but in her position as like the corporate person she already represents a is somebody who likes progress Mm -hmm. so why is she the one being challenged to not like it doesn't make sense thematically it doesn't make sense well the kids are now there to not represent the future but to represent a woman coming back to her quote-unquote womanhood yeah um, which is bullshit (laughs) i just wanted to say that the way that the dynamic between claire and owen because it's between a man and a woman and the man tears her down, it's just, it's a very sexist plot line, is basically mm-hmm. what I'm trying to say. I wanted to talk about Simon Mazrani really quick, because I hate what he did to um, John Hammond's character. Mm-hmm. In the film, he says that John Hammond entrusted him with the park to make it bigger and more lucrative and make it fun for people. And I'm like, where? No. Where did John Hammond suddenly revert back to his original capitalistic mindset? The first film establishes him as like going away from that. And in the other films, the sequels actually show him that he doesn't want that anymore. Jurassic Park, The Lost World, I think. It shows him that he doesn't want dinosaurs to be something lucrative anymore. He just wants them to be safe in the island. And that's why he sends Ian Malcolm back into the island. And it's like, how did this happen? How did Simon Mizrani suddenly get given this fucking line that erases john hammond's entire arc Mm -hmm. he is very underdeveloped as a character also Mm -hmm. and it's kind of like they tried to make him like john hammond uh but they only got the i think dinosaurs are really cool part of his personality he just he's because he's he comes off as this like i'm the owner of this really big money-making park but i don't actually care about the money or the statistics Mm -hmm, i just mm -hmm. like dinosaurs and i think they're cool and it's like okay it's like reverse john hammond because it shows him like oh yes i'm a cool ceo i'm not like other ceos i'm not in it for the money and then at the end he's like no we have to save this park like don't report to the people that there's a dinosaur loose like we have to make sure everything's like functioning yes still. i caught that too i was like this like, is oh his what? character contradicted himself yeah like okay how can you have a character who seemingly is continuing john hammond's arc 
but then have him still revert to the first mm-hmm. John Hammond. And then, like, he... And then, like, oh, my God, they introduced the helicopter thing so that oh. when his... When it was his moment to step up and fly the helicopter and then he died, yeah. it was supposed to be emotional. But I was, like... It's not emotional. <laughs> a lot of the characters feel like collateral damage. There's no depth mm-hmm. to them. And because of that, we don't have that connection with them. So when something happens, we literally do not care. It's just so frustrating how this film ruined so much of the cool aspects of Jurassic Park. Oh, gosh. No, it didn't ruin it. It just... Hey, but the dinosaurs are cool with today's modern technology. The dinosaurs It look- is. Yeah. It's so... They improved on the... The shots aren't as great as Godzilla, but you know, whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, gosh. Um, And then there's Vic Hoskins, who basically is just military man. Mm. And... So boring. He's so fucking boring. Could have made him more interesting. Yes. If you're going to introduce, like, this very complicated idea of dinosaurs and their introduction to our society as military fucking weapons you might as well give us a character that's gonna make us like question things and it doesn't he's just like velociraptors listen to you owen go ahead and take them out it's a very boring take on introducing like the militarization of dinosaurs because like yeah Yeah. we get it the military wants it for weapons and money but it's like i don't know you could have done something a little more interesting about it because we already know that the military would want to do that it's the fucking military. But then we also learn that Vic Hoskins was not working by himself. He was actually working with Dr. Wu. And that that's the reason Dr. Wu created the Indominus Rex. Because I don't know if you noticed, there's a point where Dr. Um, Dr. Wu is talking to Simon. And he's like, you guys told me you guys wanted more teeth. So why are you mad that I added more teeth? I added more teeth. But then we find out later that he was actually preparing something for a different company mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in order for him to be militarized. I don't I don't like his progress as an antagonist. No. Because there was literally nothing menacing or bad about him explaining the science DNA shit to Simon. Because he was he was literally right. He says, quote, you cannot have an animal with exaggerated predator features without the corresponding behavioral traits. Like that's literally not his fault. Mm-hmm. That's what the capitalists asked him to do. Um, and then they were like, oh, okay, well, since he's a scientist, um, and this is kind of technically his fault, it's not his fault, this means that he's the bad guy. And I'm like, no, it yeah. doesn't. It's so strange to me how every single Jurassic Park sequel has antagonized Dr. Wu. Like, because I'm watching Jurassic, oh no, Camp Cretaceous with my nieces, and Dr. Wu is like the big bad evil guy, and I don't understand how he's still working there. If he continues to be <laughs> the big bad evil guy. But I'm like, you do realize he's being paid by higher ups to do this. Like it's not him secretly being the mad scientist creating the monsters for world domination. And you no, know, he's getting paid by his bosses, like do this. Yeah, hey, you know, you realize the bad guy of this movie was the capitalism, right? You realize that or not? It's not the Asian scientist, please. <laughs> I know. It just feels racist. It's racist. <laughs> I wanna talk about dinosaurs in Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. So the T Rex is the big cool dinosaur in jurassic park and it is it is so cool like for the time it was made it's terrifying absolutely like, wow wow steven spielberg really knows how to frame shots to make it not look super like gimmicky mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. um jurassic world the lost world failed at like all the dinosaur shots in that film look gimmicky and it looks really bad but he really knows in this one at least he did it better and i was like okay that's really cool so in one of the Jurassic Park sequels, I don't remember what it's called, honestly, there's a scene where another dinosaur that was genetically made fights the T-Rex and the T-Rex loses. And it's like, people were really sad about that because people think it's like, the T-Rex is the coolest and it is the coolest. T-Rex is the coolest dinosaur out there. So the only reason that they made the T-Rex fight, the Indominus Rex in the Jurassic World, was to make up for the fan anger. No fucking like, oh, way. Are you it serious? was. It really was. Yes. <laughs> oh my fucking god. That is so like, embarrassing. Okay. Like okay, and like the entire scene where the Velociraptor blew and oh and make eye contact i think is so dumb they're not fucking pokemon <laughs> and the thing about pokemon that people misunderstand is they're not treated like this either they don't they oh my god anywho i you say anywho a lot. i just want i do <laughs> yeah. i need to 
You could erase my and any who's. <laughs> um, I just wanted to mention that the Indominus Rex, I found it very... Although it looked cool, I thought it was very gimmicky. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, a chameleon dinosaur who's really smart and has infrared sensation and can turn itself cool. And it's like, what the fuck? What did... What the fuck? <laughs> Every scene would reveal a new power and you're just like, okay. A new power? Okay. <laughs> Like, like, is this a superhero dinosaur? <laughs> it was just really annoying. Like, it could, they could have given it, like, certain mm-hmm. solid traits mm-hmm. and used them. But no, every scene was like, and it found a way to adapt to us. And it beat us. Also, very, very briefly, like, so the youngest brother, in the very beginning of the movie, the youngest brother is supposed to establish some sort of, like, childlike wonder and excitement in the audience. And I cannot express how much I did not feel that. It is a very <laughs> poor imitation of the excitement from the mo- from the first movie. And it's just, it was just so annoying to watch them try to force the excitement into yeah. the audience through that child. I was like, this is not how you're supposed to do this. <laughs> Jurassic Park, directed by Steven Spielberg, he has, like, this really iconic thing where to show wonder and the excitement people have is to show the faces of the characters. So when they see the T-Rex for the first time or the dinosaurs, um, the doctors, um, Ellie Sattler, Alan Grant, like, their jaws drop and they're, like, taking off their glasses and they're, like, in shock. And we're, it builds up that excitement mm-hmm. at the moment we get to see the dinosaurs. And I think the director of the Jurassic World failed to do that because he gave the excitement to a kid who spent most of his time running around rushing from attraction to park attraction and he didn't let us enjoy the moments of him looking at things. And if he would have slowed it down a little and let us see like that astonishment, it would have been better, I think. It's supposed to be like a shot of him running excitedly to a place and then the camera pans up towards like the dinosaur or whatever. Um, it, it, so it's definitely 100% a lot more different from how Spielberg does it. A lot of people say Spielberg is overrated, but he's actually a really good producer and director. No, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a reason why there's a lot of movies. iconic yeah. films from him. Overall thoughts? Jurassic Park is very fucking good. It's just so fucking good. <laughs> yeah. And I genuinely want to read the book. It's so good. Um, if you haven't watched Jurassic Park in a very long time, you should watch it now. Jurassic Park. One of the only books I enjoyed reading last year and now... It's now one of my favorite books of all time and rewatching it, um, the film afterwards and seeing all the changes and all the smart changes and all the themes that it, it added to it. It's just really fucking good. It's a really good movie. And it's also one of those scripts that I feel like if you're going to want to be a screenwriter, like it's really worth it to go through the script and just notice all the the smart things that they do (laughs) i read the script after i watched the movie again (gasps) recently it's just really really good and like the the notes that they make about certain aspects of the film are really smart because you realize like oh my gosh that's why they did that you are fucking genius sir i am currently looking up where to buy jurassic park good i really i want to look at the additions though i want a nice one Uh. what about what about jurassic world don't watch it no, don't That's do it. That's all I have don't to say. Do don't watch it. <laughs> don't. There's no point. I mean, look, I only watched I only watched <gasps> the first one because oh. I wanted to see dinosaurs, and I watched the second one for Justice Smith, but other than that, there was no genuine reason to watch it. I should say, um, the third um, sequel that they're making for the Jurassic World franchise, you know what they're doing? Oh, God. I haven't looked They're bringing it. back the characters of Jurassic Park. Oh, my God. And Here I know go they're going to ruin them. I know they're going to ruin them, and I know it's just for nostalgia because they know that the films that they made are failing and they need those characters. It is not but failing. Like, it is it's making n- hella money. Failing in my eyes. <laughs> 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 and I'm like, it's not just having those characters. If you add those characters, it's not going to do much for you if the questions that they posed or if they don't add anything to the theme, they're not going to be as strong as they were in Jurassic Park. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, the budget was 150 million US dollars and the box Fuck. office was 1.67 billion ew, US dollars. Ew, 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 ew no. uh, definitely and watch not Jurassic feeling. Park instead <laughs> and read the book. Yes, it's really worth it. It's a little, it's more gory, but it's really worth it because you get a more closer look at the attractions on the island, which I think you'll like a lot, Elia. They go more in depth into what was oh, set I'm up so in the park. Oh, I'm so very excited for all the discussions like, in this book. Yeah, and now we're ending it with me looking up um yeah where to buy this book 
All right. I mean, they have like a $60 one, but it doesn't look that great. <sighs> Send me the editions. I want to see them. Thank you for listening to Labyrinth at the Bazaar. You can listen to Labyrinth anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can rent Jurassic Park and Jurassic World on different streaming platforms. Show your support for our podcast by rating us on Apple Podcasts and sharing us with your friends. Follow our Twitter at LabyrinthPod where you can get updates and behind-the-scenes content. You can also send comments and questions to our Twitter, in our YouTube comment section, or to our email goldenliars at gmail.com. That's goldenliars with an S. Thank you for listening to Labyrinth of the Bazaar. Until next time. I mean, this one's nice, but it's Jurassic Park slash The Lost World, and I don't really care about The Lost World. Yeah, I, I'm probably going to read The Lost World just to see what Michael does. Whoa, it's not that bad. And here in our next bonus segment is us just <laughs> fucking shopping. <laughs> it's actually really Go nice, on. though. It's because it's black, white, and red. Let me see. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll stop recording now. Oh, okay. I'll stop. Wait, we didn't. We just say bye. We say bye. We say bye. Oh, bye. Bye. <laughs>